the winning, winning, winning blueprint, blueprint presents. presents. <laughs> And what will probably be one of the most intriguing matchups of the weekend, and who knew coming into the season that this would be a marquee matchup? It used to be, but we know Peyton Manning is no longer with the Indianapolis Colts, so what luster does this game hold anymore? That's what you were thinking. But here comes Andrew Luck, here comes a winning streak, and here all of a sudden are the Indianapolis Colts at 6-3. and three. As the 6-3 and three Indianapolis Colts travel to Foxborough to take on the 6-3 and three New England Patriots. Who knew that this was going to be a marquee matchup in week 11? I mean, the Colts have really turned it up of late. I think that win against the Packers have really jump-started this Colts team. I mean, staring a 17-point deficit in the face in that football game and being able to roar back and get it done and really feed off of the Chuck Pagano story has really been an inspiration for this Colts team. They've really taken to an identity of, you know, we're doing this for Chuck. And it's been infectious throughout that whole locker room. They've shaved their heads in a sign of unity. And they're really riding a wave of emotion right now. And you sprinkle in the fact that they have a rookie quarterback that's not too bad. He's not too shabby. And Andrew Luck, who's getting it done. All of a sudden, they're a 6-3 and three football team. And they're winning games. They finally got off the schneid getting a win on the road. So now that's not an obstacle anymore. That's not something that they can say, hey, we need to still find a way to win on the road. We haven't done it in over a year. They got that out of the way by beating a divisional foe in the Tennessee Titans on the road. And so now they know they can go on the road and get it done. That was the one obstacle that they had to overcome. So now they went on the road last week against Jacksonville and got another road victory. And so all of a sudden, they feel confident on the road now, just as confident as they feel at Lucas Oil Stadium. And so now this is a very dangerous team in the Indianapolis Colts. Meanwhile, the Patriots on the opposite side of the field went from 3-3 three and three on the season, tied with every other member of the AFC East, to 6-3 and three on the season, winning three straight and starting to play solid football on the offensive end. This defense is a question mark, however. They give it up on the defensive end. They got a lot of young players. They got a lot of guys that are still trying to learn how to get it done week in, week out basis in the National Football League. And so it's a lot of question marks on that defense. That's why they traded for Aqib Tlaib because they need help on that defense. They don't make plays on that defense. Earlier in the season, they were giving up points, but they were making plays on defense. So it was okay. They're not making plays on defense anymore. They're doing just enough. The offense is scoring points, and they're doing just enough to hold teams down to win football games. But if you're the Patriots, you need more production out of your defense. And so this is going to be an interesting game. This is going to be a big test for that Patriots defense. Because Andrew Luck and his coach offense has been performing at an abnormally high level for a rookie quarterback and a team really void of a lot of playmakers. You look at this team and Reggie Wayne is going bananas. He's playing out of his gourd right now. You look at T.Y. Hilton. Who's afraid of T.Y. Hilton? Who's afraid of Donnie Avery? But they're making plays for this Colts offense. You know, you look at Vic Ballard out of the backfield. You look at Donald Brown. These aren't household names. These aren't overly athletic guys that you're afraid of. When you look at film and you put the tape on, you say, all right, we got to stop these guys. They don't have a lot of those guys on their team. And so you look at this Colts offense and you say, what is it about this offense that makes them go? And you need not look any further then the quarterback, the rookie quarterback, Andrew Luck. He is the engine that drives this Indianapolis Colts team. He's able to move in and out of the pocket. He's able to stare down the gun barrel and make a throw knowing he's going to take a shot. He's a danger in the red zone because he's not afraid to use his legs 
to score a touchdown. He's got about four or five rushing touchdowns on the season. He's doing it all for this Indianapolis Colts team. He's very accurate. In order to win this game, if you're the Patriots, you must find a way to turn him over. He will turn the football over. You know, he has moments where he makes inaccurate throws, but only when you apply pressure to him. You give him time, he will carve you up. You let him get out of the pocket, he will carve you up. You must keep him in the pocket, and you must bring pressure in his face. Anything around him, he'll tune it out, and he'll throw the football, and he'll complete passes. You get pressure in his face, and that pocket starts to collapse, and he tries to make a throw, it'll sail on him. Now you have a chance to pick it off. Like a week ago against the Jacksonville Jaguars where he threw that pick to Dewan Landry. It sailed on him. Pressure. It elevated. He, he couldn't follow through. It sailed. Pick. That's what you have to do to Andrew Luck if you want to beat this Indianapolis Colts team. Stop the run. Apply pressure. And get turnovers. The, the Patriots are a team on offense right now that's kind of hitting their stride. They're still a little banged up. Gronkowski hasn't really been right all season. Aaron Hernandez has been in and out of the lineup. They're still working in Brandon Lloyd to this offense, but they're starting to score points. You know you're getting Danny Woodhead. You know you're getting Wes Welker. You know you're getting Gronkowski. Now they're starting to throw the ball to Brandon Lloyd. Aaron Hernandez will be back here shortly. They're starting to hit their stride on offense. And Oh, by the way, this Patriots team has been running the football this season, something that they haven't been able to do with a very much success the last few seasons. And so this is a dangerous Patriots offense. I don't think that the Colts are ready to go on the road to Foxborough and get a win quite yet. I don't think they're quite there yet. They're not far away, but I don't think they're quite at that level yet. See the Patriots doing just enough again to get it done 27-20 to 20 at home against this Colts football team. This is going to be a good game to watch, though, and I expect to be tuning in and seeing a good football game between two teams that are trying to make the postseason and are really in the driver's seat to do so. You know, if the Colts can just find a way to piece together three or four more victories, they'll find themselves in the playoffs. The Patriots are going to win the AFC East. That's a foregone conclusion. It's just when are they going to clinch and by how many games. So that's a foregone conclusion. They're going to make the postseason. Can the Colts find a way to scratch and claw and piece together three or four more victories to get them to the postseason is the ultimate question. But looking at this game, Patriots get it done 27-20. Elevate their record to 7-3 and three on the season. Meanwhile, the Colts suffered their first defeat in three weeks, dropping to 6-4 and four on the season. You look at the next matchup on the slate, and it sees the New Orleans Saints traveling to Oakland to take on the Raiders in a game that sees a hot offense taking on a struggling Oakland Raiders team. Not just struggling offense, not just struggling defense, a struggling Oakland Raiders team. They were once... Three and four on the season were the Oakland Raiders. They've proceeded to drop two in a row, and all of a sudden now, they can't get out of their own way. They're falling down on fourth down, fumbling the football. Carson Palmer is throwing interceptions, not executing on the offensive end. This defense has been absolutely shredded the past two weeks by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Baltimore Ravens, respectively, in the last two weeks. And so this is the wrong team to see if you're the Oakland Raiders after giving up over 40 points the last two weeks. You've given up a total of 92 points in your last two games. We're talking about 46 points per game given up in the last two games. And now you have to play the New Orleans Saints with Drew Brees and his high-octane offense. Man, this, this thing could get ugly, and it could get ugly in a hurry if the Raiders don't force turnovers in this game. Because they're not just going to stop the New Orleans Saints offense on their own volition. They're not going to stop them because they're able to get them off the field by just playing solid defense. They're not a good enough defense to do that right now. And so if this Saints team just comes out and executes on the offensive end, it's going to be a long day for the Oakland Raiders. I can see the Raiders giving up another 40 points if they're not careful in this game. The Saints are a very efficient offense. And ever since Joe Vick has taken over as the head coach, as the interim head coach for this team, They've looked like a different bunch. They've looked like a team that's prepared to play on Sundays. They look like a team that's much more focused on the defensive side of the football. They look like a team that's starting to hit their stride. Now, it may be too late. I think, ultimately, it'll be too late for them. Even though they're 4-5, and five, and if they can beat the Raiders, they'll go to 5-5 five and five on the season and be right back in the hunt in the NFC. 
I just think there are too many good teams in the NFC to try to come off the pace and get a playoff spot. I mean, you waited too late if you are the New Orleans Saints. But look, if they get hot enough, and this is a big if, if they get hot enough and can run off six of seven, seven of eight, and get to 10 wins, you're talking about having a realistic shot at getting a playoff berth. I mean, look, it's hard to be turned away in the NFC when you win 10 games. It doesn't happen often. I mean, you see, you look back two years ago, it did happen. Tampa Bay Buccaneers won 10 games, didn't get, get in the postseason. The Giants won 10 games one year, didn't get in. It happens, but it's rare. In the NFC, you win 10 games most times, you're going to get a ticket to the dance. So if this Saints team can find a way to get to 10, it'd be I, you'd be hard-pressed to keep them out of the postseason. Now, I'll tell you what, you get nine, you're not getting in. Nine isn't going to be good enough to get you in this year. Just too many good teams. We're talking about three alone possibly coming out and winning nine or more in the NFC North alone. You know, you, the Bears are going to top 10 wins. The Packers are going to top 10 wins. I don't know about the Vikings, but they're probably going to find themselves right around eight or nine at least. And so you're talking about three right there. You look at the NFC West. You're talking about the Seahawks. You're talking about the 49ers. These are two teams. The 49ers are going to have 10 wins. The Seahawks are going to be somewhere around there. These are teams that you're going to have to vie with. I mean, And then you're not even looking at, we know what the Falcons are doing. You don't know what's going on in the NFC. Someone has to win that division. I think the Giants are going to get their act together and win that division. But the Cowboys are going to be playing better football. You just don't know. There's so many teams for them to have to leapfrog to get where they want to go, is what I'm trying to say. But you win against the Raiders and you get to 5-5, five and five, that's all you can do is win football games. You let the rest of that stuff take care of itself. You win football games, you stack up wins like bricks, and at the end of the season, you let them sort it out and find out where you get to go. Either it's home or it's to someone else's stadium to go play a playoff game. But in this game, the Saints are the better football team. I expect them to be able to pass the ball. I expect them to be able to run the ball. And I like Chris Ivory. I've, I've said it on this program several times. You need to play him. I think they see what they have in Chris Ivory. He's an asset. And like I've said, either you're going to play him or you need to trade him. But he's an asset either way. Put him on the field. Let him show you what he can do. He's shown you the last two weeks with long touchdown runs what he can bring to this Saints offense. They might be getting Darren Sproles back. I expect them to dominate this Raiders team offensively. I expect them to score points. I expect them to do all the things that's necessary for them to beat this Raiders team and beat them handily, not make this a close ball game. The Raiders aren't a good football team. But if you're a Raiders fan, you need to look at this thing with a big pitcher view. Look at this thing as the franchise being turned around. They're doing it the right way. New general manager, new head coach, and you can see the wheels starting to turn in motion for them to be a good football team. They're not that right now because they don't have the pieces in place. They're not a talented football team. There was a lot of dead weight and excess baggage that they had to shed themselves of before they could start to turn this thing around. Now, they don't have a lot of money to spend, and they didn't have a lot of draft picks because Al Davis wasn't fond of holding on to draft picks, and he spent money in a lot of areas and overpaid for guys. They're starting to rectify that situation, though. And so, if you're the Raiders, they're getting this franchise where it needs to be slowly. They're making steps. They're trying to put down a new hardwood floor. But in, in order to do that, you got to get rid of that old, dirty, moldy floor first. You got to pull that up. And it takes a lot of work to pull every single tile off that floor in order to lay your new hardwood floor down. And that's what the Raiders are doing. They're taking apart this old, dirty moldy floor piece by piece by piece as you see the Raiders are a more disciplined team that's one piece of that floor coming up you know the Raiders are starting to free up salary cap that's another piece of that floor the Raiders are starting to bring in guys who get it guys who are smart football players that's another piece of that floor they're starting to hold on to their draft picks that's another piece of the floor you see that floor starting to be built slowly and if you're a Raiders fan it takes time it's not going to happen overnight, but you see the things that need to start happening for you to actually be a viable franchise in the National Football League. And so while you're not going to win this game, and you may not win many more this season, this thing is going in the right direction. But it won't help you in this game. You'll lose to the New Orleans Saints, 
33 to 20, dropping you to 3 and 7 on the season. Meanwhile, the Saints will go to 5 and 5 on the season. And I tell you what, if they can get hot enough, they got a shot. But I think it's too late. I honestly think it's too late. That's the way the cookie crumbles in the National Football League. You make a mistake, you pay for your mistake, and sometimes it ultimately costs you in the end. So we look at the next game on the slate, and it sees the San Diego Chargers traveling to the Denver Broncos. What's the number one rule? I don't even need to say it. You know the number one rule. I know the number one rule. It doesn't even apply in this game because they're not going to win this game. The Denver Broncos are the better team. They've already defeated this San Diego Chargers team earlier in the season on the road in San Diego. They're at home in this matchup. They are playing some blistering hot football right now. Peyton Manning is playing out of his mind. And look, we know Peyton Manning can do this. So it's not out of you know the realm of possibility that Peyton Manning could be doing this on an NFL field week in and week out. But it's just amazing to see him do this, having not played all last year, having people question the arm strength, question whether he'll be able to take a shot and have him just come out and pick up right where he left off, as if he never suffered an injury, as if he never had a season off, as if there was never any rust. I mean, he just is playing phenomenal football. He has this Denver Broncos team leading this division. They're going to win this division. And this game, to me, signifies the end of this division for anyone to compete because the Chargers are the only other competent team in this division. And if the Broncos are able to, which I believe they will, ultimately do after this game is all said and done. Sweep this San Diego Chargers team. There'll be two games uh, above them in the win column, just playing them head-to-head. -head. There'll be three games above them in the win column, and this, this division will be over. This division will be done. The Broncos will have this thing basically sewn up like a tailor, and all they have to do is just continue to win and try to elevate themselves in the landscape of the AFC in terms of seeding. They're, they're looking to get some home field advantage. They want home cooking. And so they're going to win this game. They're the better team. They take care of the football better. I mean, the Chargers, we know what they do. They self-destruct every single week. And so this Broncos team, only problem that they have on offense, the one liability is Willis McGahee. He seems to fumble every single week. They need to shore that up. And they need to get Willis McGahee securing the football better because He's the only person not getting it done on offense in terms of securing the football. Everyone else, and Demarius Thomas, he seems to like to fumble every now and again. But fumbles are their issue. They're not throwing interceptions. Peyton Manning isn't turning the football over for the most part. They're taking care of the ball. They're scoring points. They're an explosive offense. They're getting it done, and this defense is starting to play better. They're starting to gain confidence because they know this offense has our back. So whether we go out and give up a touchdown or not, we're fine because this offense is going to get it back and then some. And then we can pin our ears back, get after the quarterback, force some turnovers. And we know if we turn a team over and give the ball to Peyton Manning in prime field position, we're getting points. And that's a luxury to have, knowing that if we get a turnover, oh, it's points. Whether it's three or seven remains to be seen, but it's points either way. And so this Denver Broncos team is dangerous. They're going to win this game. They're the best team in the AFC West, and it's not close. And they're going to basically submit their division title in this ball game by beating San Diego Chargers 31 to 20, taking their record to 7 and 3 on the season, dropping the one other competent team in the San Diego Chargers in the AFC West down to 4 to 6 on the season and basically ending any hopes of the Chargers making the postseason and ending any hopes of anyone else in that division of winning that division crown. And the Broncos will repeat as division champs for the second consecutive year in the AFC West. So, Sunday night football. <laughs> Sunday night football sees the Baltimore Ravens traveling to the Pittsburgh Steelers to take on the Steelers in a matchup that over the years has come to be one of the most physical, brutal, and just downright defensive struggles of the last decade. We've come to love it. If you like defensive struggles, if you like hard-hitting football, if you like close games that come 
down to the end. This has been the rivalry for you. This has been a family business that repeatedly has had you at the edge of your seat wanting more. This matchup has lost its luster, however, this season because A, the schedule makers decided it was a good idea to put these two teams against each other twice towards the back half of the schedule, and nobody's healthy. You look at this game, there's no Ray Lewis. There's no Troy Palomalo. There's no Ben Roethlisberger. There's no Ladarius Webb. I mean, there's guys missing all over the place in this game. There's no Antonio Brown. There's just guys missing everywhere. There's going to be no Jimmy Smith for the Ravens. Not saying that he's a big part of this rivalry, but still. Guys are missing left and right. And so you're just left with whoever's left. It's a war of attrition in this ballgame. Whoever can outlast the other team in this game is going to win. And if Ben Roethlisberger doesn't suffer that injury a week ago, Oh, it's still it's all day in this game. No doubt in my mind, they're at home. They're playing some really solid football of late. They went into New York, smacked the Giants around, came out with the W. You know, they had smacked the Redskins around at home. They went to Cincinnati, smacked the Bengals around, came out with the W there. They had been playing some really physical, imposing football. They were running the football. Ben Roethlisberger was continuing to be efficient. They were playing good football. No doubt in my mind, they were going to be able to dispose of these Ravens. Had Ben Roethlisberger played in this game. You insert Byron Leftwich, however. Now we're talking about a whole different team. We're talking about a whole different ball game. I don't trust this Steelers team without Ben Roethlisberger. We saw what they did last year without Ben Roethlisberger. And we're not talking about the little 3-1 and one start they had that year he was suspended for, for the first four games. We're not talking about that. Because they had a little cupcake run then. You know, they lost to the Ravens in that start when they went 3-1. and one. The only loss was to the Ravens, but they had a lot of little cupcake, a lot of cupcake victories in that stretch. We're talking about some big boy football now. We're talking about Steelers and Ravens. We're talking about some serious family business where people get in each other's face. Family members are getting in each other's faces and coming to blows. This is some real, real family business here. This isn't that St. Louis Rams, San Francisco can't agree to disagree. You know, you argue no one gets their point across and we both walk away and nobody wins. This isn't that type of family business. This is some, um, you're going to hear what I have to say and if you won't listen, I'm going to make you listen to what I have to say. This is that type of family business. And so, this thing is going to get ugly. It's going to be physical. And no Ben Roethlisberger doesn't take away from the fact that this is going to be a physical matchup. Two teams that don't like each other. They respect each other. They don't like each other. And so that's the way I like my family business. I don't have to like you, but you must respect me. You don't respect me, then I have a problem. That means I'm not doing enough in your eyes to garner your respect. That means you feel like you can walk in my house, smack me around, leave with a W. That means you feel like when I come to your house, you're not even going to let me in. You're going to let me stand outside, freezing in the cold, and not open the door. And, and you don't have to because you don't respect me enough to let me in. And so that's not what this matchup is about. This is some serious family business. But this matchup has been tainted by the injury to Ben Roethlisberger. I just don't see the Steelers being able to just run the football. And look, teams have ran the football on this Ravens team this year. So if the Steelers can somehow get the Ravens to buy into the fact that they can still throw the football with Byron Leftwich, then maybe they can run the football because everyone else has been able to run the football on this Baltimore Ravens defense for the most part. And so if you can trick them into thinking that you can still throw the football and make them respect your passing game and you're able to open up lanes for Mendenhall, who I think is going to be back, for Isaac Redmond, for Jonathan Dwyer, you might be able to skate with the running game and sprinkle in a little bit of Byron Leftwich and get away with the W. But I don't see it happening. I just don't see it happening because if I'm the Ravens, you got to beat me, Byron Leftwich. This running game, it won't happen. You And look, Byron Leftwich can throw the football. But you haven't started in three years. You haven't started for a reason. And I don't think you can get it done. You have to show me. I'm from Missouri. Show me. And so I expect the Ravens to make them one-dimensional. Hey, Byron Leftwich, beat me. With that long 
pitcher delivery windup. I wouldn't be surprised if Terrell Suggs is able to come from behind, swat that thing out of there, force a turnover. That end up that ends up being the deciding factor in this game. It's still going to be close. Just because Ben Roethlisberger isn't playing doesn't mean this Ravens team is just going to jump all over the, the Steelers. They're still in Pittsburgh. They're still a good football team. This is still a top flight defense. They're still going to have to they're still going to have to work for everything they get. But I just don't see the Steelers being able to win without Ben Roethlisberger against a Ravens team that can score points. Not the best on defense anymore, but they can still score points. As long as they don't turn it over, as long as they don't forget that Ray Rice is one of their best players, they'll be fine in this game, and I think they'll do enough to get the victory 20-17 to 17 against these Steelers. But this is going to be an interesting matchup because if the Steelers are able to pull this one out at home without Ben Roethlisberger, what does that say about the Baltimore Ravens? Forget about the Steelers because if Ben Roethlisberger isn't going to be back anytime soon, they're not winning the Super Bowl. They might not even make the playoffs. So forget about the Steelers. What does that say about the Ravens? You can't go into Pittsburgh without Ben Roethlisberger and get it done. What does that say? That is what is at stake in this game. For your mental approach, for your psyche, you have to go into Pittsburgh and win this game without Ben Roethlisberger. You have to. Because if you can't do that and he comes back healthy, in, say, five weeks, and you have to play this team in the playoffs, and you have to play this team in the postseason, and you weren't able to beat them, then, what does that, what does that mean for you? What, is, what does that say to you? Because if the Steelers take you out here, they still have to come to M&T, and you can get them back. But you know, they got us without Roethlisberger once already. Now he's back. We're in trouble. And so you must win this football game. You must. And I see you getting it done 20 to 17, taking your record to 8 and 2 on the season, dropping the Steelers who are breathing down your necks right now. Takes them down to 6 and 4 on the season. And that's going to do it for the Sunday slate of games. Of course, we've omitted one game. That being the Redskins taking on the Philadelphia Eagles, which we will go over in the Redskins report. But every other game for the Week 11 slate has been gone over and, and been prognosticated. Except, of course, for the Monday night game as well. But that's for the Monday episode. So that's a touchdown. Throw it up. Go ahead. Don't be afraid. Throw it up. Let's tack on this quick extra point. Now, I was able to get it done. On Thursday night football, and, and I'm very gracious for the Bills, you know, answering my pleads for them to win this game. Didn't want to start off the week with a loss, and I'm I'm going to tell you guys right now. I feel so confident, more confident than I have ever felt this season about my picks. I honestly think I'm going to return to you on Monday. With one, maybe two losses at the most. I feel so supremely confident about my picks this week. That I feel that there's no way I don't come out smelling like anything less than a rose this week. I mean, literally, from top to bottom, I felt really good about every game I checked off. With the exception of that Bills game. And I got it done already. I got the one game that I had my head and I was scratching. I got that done already. I got that one out of the way. So now I feel supremely confident about what I'm going to put forth this week. I really feel like I got a grasp of what's going on in the league. Now look, it's a fluid league. It's a week-to-week -week league. We've already discussed that. So me feeling like I have a grasp of everything means absolutely nothing. But to me, I feel like I know what's going on. And I feel like I can diagnose who's going to get it done, who's not. You know, I know who's injured, who's not, who's playing, who's not. And so these things have a bearing on the outcome of the game. I feel good about what I'm putting forth this week. And so you can look, as I will, at the end of this episode, divulge to you, you know, the Pick'em Weekly uh, sheet that displays everything I've done to this point this season and 
has my record. Last week was not a good week. Last week was not a good week. But that can be overcome by a excellent week this week. And I think I'm going to have an excellent showing. And so you're going to see what I did last week, which was not a good week. You're going to see what I've done in past weeks. And you're going to see my overall mark on the season. And I really think that I've done a phenomenal job given that this season has been crazy. And so I expect to do big things. You'll see all the picks that I've made uh, for this week, my sole survivor pick. Everything will be uh, on that sheet. And uh, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the football. And, and it's holiday season. You should be in the spirit. Everything should be just, it's a great time of year. It's my favorite time of year. I told you. You know, and so we'll get into all of those things next week. Just enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the football. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Inbox, all of these things. Check me out on Facebook, In The Lab Room is a Facebook page. On Twitter, at In The Lab Room is a Twitter handle. Um, in The Lab Room at gmail.com is the inbox. And Louis T is the YouTube page. Check it out. Click on the tab. Subscribe to the page. Every video is listed that I've ever done. I thank you for joining me on the program today. It was a very informative, very productive program, and I think... This is going to yield me an excellent week come Monday. I'll see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. I'll see you after the games, and we'll go over everything that occurred over the weekend. Have a good one. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.